Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume in September of 2021 here in our home city of New York for the first time. But our goal at those conferences and on these talks is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big, important ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Gary Ginsburg to SALT Talks. Uh, Gary grew up in Buffalo, New York, home to two U.S. presidents. He's a lawyer by training, but he spent his uh, professional career at the intersection of media, politics, and law. He wrote a great book that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, he, he previously worked for the Clinton administration, was a senior editor and counsel at the political magazine George, and then spent the next two decades in executive positions in media and technology at News Corp, Time Warner, and then most recently at SoftBank. He's published pieces in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and was, was an on-air political contributor in the early days of MSNBC. He lives in New York City uh, with his wife and two sons, the book that he just published is called First Friends, and it's a fascinating read uh, about the close friends of several U.S. presidents that ended up shaping American history and having a big uh, impact on the presidents that they served with. Uh, and that book comes out July 6th. So uh, if you're out of the beach over the holiday weekend, uh, look in your bookstores uh, for that new book, First Friends. But hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm. Anthony is also an author himself, and I have to add, since we're talking about politics today, Anthony uh, spent, what is it, 11 days, Anthony, uh, working in politics, uh, but but we think that's the end of his political yeah, career, but yeah, you never know. Gary, he brings it up all the time. It's not it's like, you, you, know, it, it, you know, it happened four million years ago. Let me just hold on a second. I'm on the phone with my CFO. I just want to make sure that my W-2 is not going to John Darcy right now. I mean, he sits in my office. He's taking over. Yes, please make sure it's not going to John Darcy. Thank you. Okay, hold on a second, Gary. So, Gary. Anthony. Buffalo, New York. Uh, my wife went to the University of Buffalo. It's the second largest city in this great state, the Empire State. It is a unique place. So I want you to describe Buffalo to people that have never been to Buffalo. And I'm going to have a little tell here. I have, obviously, family members in Buffalo visit often. And my family is originally from Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, which is a lot like Buffalo, as you know. So go ahead. Tell us about Buffalo for those that don't know Buffalo and how you grew up. Well, Buffalo gets a bad rap, Anthony, as you know, for being snowbound, hard scrabble, you know, bad luck city. It was the fifth largest city in the United States at the turn of the last century. And then William McKinley gets assassinated and basically the fortunes of the city go down from there. But I grew up in a city that is the queen city. It's a city of good neighbors. It's a city of hardworking people. It's a hard, it's a blue collar city where people work hard. They play hard. They love their Buffalo Bills. I have loved the Buffalo Bills since I was old enough to breathe. It's a, it's a hard, it's a tough team to follow, tough team to love. But I think our fortunes are looking really up as the city is. And you got great food. It's a great it's culture. A great Beef on Weck. I mean, city's got everything. And, and listen, as you and said, it was and a socialist mayor, a new socialist <laughs> mayor. <laughs> well, you probably like that a little bit more than I do. All right, but 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 I, I just think it's important to bring up your background because Buffalo. When I think of that city, I think of friendship. You're writing a, a book about first friends, the new book, uh, which I found fascinating. Obviously, I have an interest in politics. And it is illuminating to me that it's a presidency of one man or soon to be one woman. Uh, eventually, I expect that to happen. But let's just use the masculine term right now because of the last 46 presidents. It's a presidency of one man, but it's really a presidency of many confidants and people that that one person has to rely on. And so tell us why you wrote the book and give us some of your insights there. Yeah, it's a good observation. Um well, since I was a little kid, I've always been fascinated by the American presidency. And as I got older and more involved in business and in politics, 
I started observing leaders and the people they kept around them. I mean, I'm sure you you did in your 11 days. And I started to see the influence that their closest friends had on them, how they could speak to the leader in a way that nobody else could, you know, speak the blunt truth. Well, obviously, I was speaking that way to the leader, which got me blown into Pennsylvania yeah. Avenue. But that's a separate topic. Yeah, the usual for a different first friend talk. of what, like a couple of weeks, right? Oh, but, I mean, I don't know. If you wrote a book about Trump, it would be no friends. Okay, well, not, There's no first friends. I mean, the guy literally had no friends, well, but that's, that's a whole exactly. separate book. Well, I was going there with that because okay. that was one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I, I mean, I, when I was... Younger, I worked on the Gary Hart campaign, 1984. You're probably too young to remember that campaign, but I watched Warren Beatty, you know, the great Hollywood star, and he parachuted in for the most important events. And he was the only one around Beatty. I was 21 years old, so I was very attuned to all this stuff. And he'd say, stop talking and acting like a politician, Gary. Come on, you're better than this. And Hart, Hart would just, you know, he'd listen in a way he wouldn't listen to anybody else. But at the same time, he could also you know, they'd have these late night marathon talks and he would loosen him up and enliven him in a way nobody else could. And then I was I was uh, I worked on uh, Bill Clinton's campaign in 1992. And I saw the same effect. I saw the, the impact that his closest friends had on his campaign and in particular, the role that Vernon Jordan played. Um, and then just to fast forward to what you brought up, you know, I was I was struck by the corollary of what happened with Trump, the lack of any close friend around him, particularly, you know, in those last two months of his presidency, when no one dared to speak the hard truth to him, to get him off the big lie and perhaps save him from his second impeachment. And obviously you could notice, you could see that at the beginning of his presidency. And I talked to somebody very close to the president who will go unnamed, who said, frankly, he didn't need it. He didn't need a first friend. All he needed was the affirmation of the masses. So in effect, his Twitter feed became his first friend. And I think that had a really pernicious effect on his presidency. So based on all these observations about three years ago, I decided, hey, let's let's see if there's anything on first friends in presidential literature. Turns out there's nothing. There's books, as you know, about first wives, first sons, first butlers, first chefs, first pets, but no one's ever written a book about first friends. So I looked around, spent about a year doing research, found, I think, I hope, nine good stories of first friendships and wrote the book. Story, the stories are great. I mean, they're 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 great uh, because they're touching. They bring about the humanity of the situation, the pressure on the American president, the decision making. For anybody that's never read the presidential brief, once you read it, it's a life changing thing because there's dilemmas. Uh, Richard Newstadt once said about the presidency, if it gets to the desk of the president. It means that there were 5,000 other people in the executive branch that really could not make the decision. So now you're going from, wow, this could be a really bad outcome to an even worse outcome. Go ahead, sir. You make that decision. Right. And now you're sitting there. I want to switch right away to Abraham Lincoln, who suffered from crippling depression. And before he went on to end slavery and change the, the country, who was his best friend? And how did that relationship play out? You write such a beautiful story in the book. Oh, thank you. Um, so let's go to 1837. This beanpole of a man walks into a store in Springfield, Illinois. He's a new lawyer looking for a place to live, looking for bedding, actually. Walks into the store, says, you got any bedding? He says, yeah, I got it, but it's 17 bucks. Lincoln doesn't have 17 bucks. But the store owner, Joshua Speed, knows of Lincoln because he's a aspiring politician himself. And he says, you know what? I got a bed upstairs. Go check it out. If you like it, it's you, we can share it. So Lincoln goes upstairs, checks out the bed, comes back down and says, Speed, I moved in. And for the next four years, they share a bed. I don't believe it was sexual. People have tried to suggest it was. There's no evidence to support that. Then in 1841, he falls under this crippling depression and Speed essentially saves his life, takes away all of his sharp objects, ministers to him, gets him back to health. And Lincoln says at one point, you know, if I die now, no one will remember me. Well, Speed made sure, made sure that people would remember him. Uh, he gets back on his feet. He goes on to obviously a, a career as a lawyer. Speed goes on to be a slave owner, a plantation owner, a big businessman in Kentucky. They come back together again in the 1850s um, debating slavery. But their relationship is so strong based on what happened in the 18, early 1840s that one of the first meetings he has as president-elect is with Speed. And he says, Speed, I need you in my cabinet, I need you in my government. But Speed's making too much money. You know what that's like, Anthony, You're making too much money to join the government. 
So he says, I'm going to help you out, help you, you know, in my role as first friend. And what he does is he basically keeps Kentucky in the union. It's one of the, the six border states, but he does everything he can to keep the state part of the union. It does. Um, they remain, they become even closer friends once Lincoln is in the White House. He spends Thanksgiving with them in 1861. Uh, he's one of the first people to hear about the Emancipation Proclamation. He's with them right at the end before he dies. And it's really one of the great friendships that affected history because without Joshua Speed, we may never have known the name of Abraham Lincoln. So no, I was just telling you, it's an amazing story, but if you wrote a chapter on Trump, it could be first grifters because you mentioned right. about not being, you know, be able to make money or you're losing money in the White House. These guys were making hundreds of millions of dollars for themselves inside the White House with complete disregard of the uh, ethics yeah. laws. You know, I, I when they asked me to serve, I went to go sell the company. Thank God the company, it, it didn't sell. I'm back at the company. But I just think it's, it's, it's an interesting thing, the evolution of the presidency and the friends and potentially some of the bad people around the president as well. FDR, you describe him in the book, is extremely lonely and very overworked. And he had a couple of friends. There was a friend that I think passed away. He was a, a person that worked with him when he was governor. Yes. Uh, I think yeah. it was how Yep. He passed away. Yeah. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, a, a very touching story there. And then, of course, the famous Harry Hopkins and the intrigue around Harry Hopkins. And he had a friendship, but a strain in his relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. So talk about uh, FDR. Yeah, well, I think you're absolutely right that he was, I think, consumed with loneliness, even though he's fighting a world war and a crippling depression. Um, he says to the first friend that I identify in the book, Daisy Sickley, a distant cousin, who says, you know, I'm either exhibit A or left entirely alone. And what would happen is he would have 22 meetings in a day. The, he would then go upstairs and there was no one around him. His kids were either off to war or ne'er-do-wells who, who he just didn't particularly have a close relationship with. His wife is one of the great crusaders, you know, the 20th century, brilliant, brilliant woman, has an independent life. From him. They are estranged in 1918 when she discovers a trove of letters that reflect a deep relationship with a mistress who then comes back into his life at the end. So he doesn't have a he doesn't have a family life, doesn't have a home life. And so he becomes friendly uh, to the point of, I believe, it's a it's a first friendship with this sixth cousin. And she provides him an emotional ballast that he needed during his presidency. He wouldn't have been as natural or as effective a president without Daisy Sickley. Um, John Alter, one of Roosevelt's, I think most esteemed historian says that in the book, and I think it's true. She was the antidote to that loneliness. She provided uh, emotional succor. She provided a constant presence, a really compassionate voice, a listening ear, um, was with him for every important moment of the last few years of his presidency. And was probably more attuned to his decline in health as anyone with the exception of his daughter, Anne, and really ministers to him in those last couple of years and is with him at the end in Warm Springs when he dies. What an amazing story. And, and, and the loneliness is so true because they have to make these decisions by themselves. They're also, they, people are coming at them, Gary, and they don't even know if it's a, a friendship or it's a manipulation or What's the angle? Uh, Barack and Michelle Obama both write in their books uh, that they stopped creating new friends once they got to the presidency for this reason. They didn't know what the agendas were for different people. Exactly. Uh, but pro so did but Kennedy. Prior and Kennedy said the same thing. He said, I have enough friends. I don't need any new friends. Yeah. And it's an interesting point. I'm going to bring up J John Kennedy in a second. He met David Ornsby Gore in pre-war London. Uh, Gore goes on to become a uh, foreign policy advisor for him. Tell us about that story and how influential was Ormsby Gore on John F. Kennedy? Well, I, I, I said in the book, and I believe it quite, quite vehemently, that he was the most important foreign policy advisor to the president of the United States, despite not being an American citizen. What an anomaly that is. Um, as you said, they met in 1938. They debated um, right off the bat, they were both second sons of powerful fathers and strong older brothers. Both of their older brothers die. They both are a little bit lost in 1938, but they bond over their love of 
of carousing, of horse racing, of golfing, of debating. They love to go to the House of Commons and see Churchill in action. And they start to really question, like, what is the role of a leader in a democracy? Is it to follow the dictates of the public and, and do what the public wants? Or do you take that bold stand as Churchill was doing in the late 30s and saying, no, we have to rearm in the face of, of German rearmament and provide a bulwark against their rising militarism? And so that debate kind of carries through for the next 25 years. And when Kennedy becomes president, I think Ormsby Gore basically calls on that 25 years of friendship to convince Kennedy to do what is right, both in terms of how he approached the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was a, a, a central player throughout those last seven days. Um, and then more importantly, in the adoption of the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, without David Ormsby Gore, his counsel, his friendship, his wisdom, and the 25 years of friendship, I don't think you would have had that first significant piece of legislation, which led to the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Well, there's a, there's a great story in Evan Thomas's book, uh, The Last 100 Days of John Kennedy, about Ormsby Gore uh, working with John Kennedy to get the, the nuclear test ban. And one of the things they have to do is they have to go influence uh, Eisenhower. And of course, Eisenhower's close first friend was his chief of staff that was under potential indictment by the Kennedy Justice Department. Of course, it's a very famous story where Ormsby Gore says to JFK, why don't you give Ike a call and let's do a trade? You you, you guys won't push hard on his uh, former first friend, uh, but you'll need his support for the nuclear test ban for the Republicans in Congress. And so uh, uh, Eisenhower doesn't like this. Uh, He's not a politician, but he cedes to the request uh, and shortly, a few days later, he writes an op-ed in support of the nuclear test ban, which helps get it done. So first friends in trouble sometimes are influencing uh, the course of history as well. Yes. You know, it's interesting. Eisenhower, um, after the Bay of Pigs, he, he, Kennedy's you know feeling horrible. He calls Eisenhower. And Eisenhower says, didn't you have anybody in the room to argue against this crazy ass invasion plan? And Kennedy says, no. Because Kennedy has a has a three and a half hour meal with Ormsby Gore at the end of January. He goes through all the foreign policy crises he's facing. He doesn't bring up Cuba because at this point, Ormsby Gore is not even the ambassador. He's just a he's a friend. He's the minister of state. He doesn't feel like he can talk to a foreigner like this. And I think what he he learns his lesson from that, and that is why he calls Ormsby Gore on day six of the Cuban Missile Crisis and says, "Come to the White House." unseen, and let's debate this thing out, blockade or bombing. And they spend hours, basically, and he listens to Armsby Gore, and Armsby Gore says, blockade, don't bomb. And then he obviously, as I, you probably remember, he, he he actually moves the perimeter in from 800 miles to 500 miles in the blockade to leave the Russians more time, which is just brilliant. And nobody else in the government had thought of it. And thank God, Curtis LeMay, General Curtis LeMay, was not John F. Kennedy's first friend because he was calling for he was calling for a nuclear strike, which would would have probably caused 60 million deaths. Um, So let's switch back a little bit. I want to go to Thomas Jefferson for a second, if you don't mind, and his very interesting and very close relationship with James Madison, uh, two two of the founding fathers, both becoming presidents. Tell us about their relationship. Yeah, that was one of the real, real wonderful delights of this process was discovering that friendship. I mean, everybody thinks of Thomas Jefferson as kind of the dominant player of that duo. And very few know that they exchanged 1,250 letters, were intimate friends for literally 50 years from 1776 to 1826 when Jefferson dies. And I think that it's probably the most consequential friendship in American history. It was more than a friendship. It was a collaboration. It was a power field because the two of them together could do so much more than they could do individually. And I think for Jefferson to be Jefferson and Madison to be Madison, they needed that friendship. They were very different in looks, personality, temperament. Uh, They they were both sons of Virginia. They, they, They were joined by that. They were both, you know, uh, came from big, rich families. Um, they were both philosophers, statesmen, but but Jefferson was kind of this big thinker, this idealist. 
Madison was five foot four and much more pragmatic. And so Jefferson would have these big ideas that he needed Madison to actually execute. And Madison, for his part, I think, kept Jefferson in the game on a, two occasions when we may have lost Thomas Jefferson to history. Um, he was the governor of Virginia in 1781. He was basically run out of the Capitol. He was put on trial, essentially, by the Virginia legislature for abdication of, of responsibility. And he was acquitted, but he was so distraught by it all that he said, I'm done. I'm done with politics. This is 1782. And only because of Madison's intercession does, does Jefferson decide to get back into public life. He ends up going to Paris, and that's where you know he flowers as his diplomat. But the two of them at various moments keep each other engaged such that their collaboration at the end of the day results in so much of what we experience today in our democracy. Two parties, they form the Democratic Republican Party. Madison is really responsible for the Constitution and a lot of that intellectual framework comes from, from Jefferson's gifts of books from Paris. They form the Bill of Rights. That's because Jefferson is pushing Madison hard for a Bill of Rights immediately after uh, Madison explains what the Constitution is in a letter to him. And then their collaboration, you know, results in the revolution of 1800, which is, you know, changes Federalist rule to Republican rule, Democratic rule, and then the Louisiana Purchase. And ultimately, they collaborate on the University of Virginia in their later years. So it was an amazingly productive friendship, a loving friendship, 1,250 letters between them, and it changes history. It's, a, it, it, it's an amazing story about them. And uh, but it also speaks to the fact that you need people to lean on, particularly when you're having setbacks, uh, which is uh, something that uh, a lot of these guys, of course, have because the trials and tribulations of politics. So you work for Bill Clinton. I did. What were you doing for Bill Clinton, Gary? Tell everybody. Uh, well, I started as his first advance director uh, way back in January of, of uh, 92. Actually, the first day I got down there, Anthony was the day that uh, Jennifer Flowers had her famous press conference at the Plaza Hotel. So I thought, I may not even need to unpack my bags here in Little Rock. I can head right back to my law firm in New York. But, you know, he survived it. Um, I did that for three months until April when he was basically the nominee. And then I went up to Washington to work on the VP selection process. I was one of five lawyers who were holed up in an unmarked law office in downtown Washington vetting candidates. Uh, and then I worked on uh, the presidential transition, the, uh, and then I was in the White House Counsel's Office in 1993 and the, the Justice Department at the end of 93 and 94, and then I went back to New York. What, 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 what would you say about Bill Clinton and his first friends? I would say that Bill Clinton of the 46 presidents probably had the greatest capacity for friendship. Um, when he left law school in 1972, he wrote down his life's goals, and his third goal was to have good friends. And I think he clearly accomplished that. Um, in 1992, when his campaign is floundering a month after I get down there, his best friends go up to New Hampshire and basically attest to his character and save his candidacy. Um, Vernon Jordan, I write about you know, it's a great length in my final chapter. And I think that was a real, a true friendship, a friendship of equals, a friendship of incredible respect, shared interests, shared values, a shared love of politics and sports and of women. Um, it has an unfortunate turn toward the end when Vernon Jordan becomes, you know, a central witness in the impeachment and investigation of, of his relationship with Monica Lewinsky. But I think it shows Clinton's amazing capacity for friendship, which is one of his great traits. Yeah, and listen, I admire him. I uh, My friend Rick Lerner was my roommate, and he, I don't know if you would remember Rick Lerner, but sure. he worked for you guys. Uh, sure. uh, my first visit to the White House was back in 93 as a result of Rick, but I went to New Hampshire with Rick to see then-candidate Governor Clinton campaign, and I was amazed about his personality. And I'll, and I'll tell you how old fashioned we all are. Somebody called him the disc drive presidential candidate. What did he mean by that? Any place that he went, he found the disc to put into his computer to talk about. He was talking yeah. to union leaders. Then he was talking to entrepreneurs. Then he was talking to governmental officials. 
he found the disk. Okay, now of course we don't we operate off the cloud today, Gary, but that's what they said about Bill Clinton in 1992, yeah. 1991, yeah. actually. Yeah. So funny. can I just can I just interject yeah, for one thing? Please, David, please. Gergen, David Gergen had a really interesting observation to that point. He said that his friends served as a basis for his narrative. He would make friends. He would learn as much as he could about their friend's life, and it would it would kind of fit into this mosaic that he was forming of what you know how to run as president, how to discuss people's travails, their struggles, their challenges, their dreams. Everybody had a story, and every story then fit into that mosaic and into ultimately his campaign narrative. Yeah, he he, he is a very very interesting uh, guy. Great capacity for learning. He came to our Salt Conference in 2010. I was in the green room with him prior to interviewing him. He was trying to assess me, so he said, "So, what party are you a member of?" <laughs> and I reached into my pocket, Gary, and I I pulled out a roll of bills. And I said, I'm a member of the Green Party, Mr. President. I work on Wall Street. What party do you think I'm a member of? Okay. But he never forgot that. Every time I run into him, he always says, hey, Green yeah. Party. He doesn't know my name. He's a hey, Green Party member. You know, Amazing memory. Right, well, well, I have to turn it over to my millennial friend. Okay, John Dorsey is a first friend of mine, despite the fact that I give him guff. And he's obviously trying to. He's the baby boss at Skybridge. You see him sitting there. See that? Um, office. Yeah. Yes, it's it's and he's mercurial too, Ginsburg. I want to make sure you know that about him. Okay, he's gonna come across g- congenial here, but yeah. he has a tendency for mercurial behavior. Okay. But go ahead, John. I know you have some questions for Gary. Yeah, when Anthony's out of the office, I squat in his corner office here, and I think there's squatters rights in New York. So I, I don't know if he's gonna be welcome. Well, that's true. Office, but that's um, true because we also have a socialist mayor. I'm sure. You, I'm sure that office is yours now. That's true. Yeah. Um, there were so many fascinating stories. Uh, Anthony got to a lot of them, but I also thought the uh, Franklin Pierce, Nathaniel Hawthorne story was was very interesting. Nathaniel Hawthorne is is known largely for his romantic works, including the Scarlet Letter is probably the one he's most famous for. But he also wrote a very consequential uh, campaign biography of his great friend Franklin Pierce, uh, much to the dismay of some of his colleagues uh, in the abolitionist movement. But can you talk about their friendship, how much impact Nathaniel Hawthorne had on Franklin Pierce. Sure. Yes. Um, when he writes that campaign biography, um, you know, people said that, you know, it, it ostensibly his first work of nonfiction, but a lot of people believed it was just a continuation of his fiction work because it had so glorified a man who, for many, many people, did not think he deserved it. You know, Franklin Pierce is probably the saddest president in our history. Um, his presidency was sad. His home life was sad. He lost three sons in quick succession, including his last son, two months before he's inaugurated. Um, it's essentially two men against the world. Um, as you say, they were both they were both actually in support of slavery because they believed that slavery was uh, enshrined in the Constitution, was a was the, a right of states to uh, to maintain, and they wanted to preserve the Union over pursuing the abolition of slavery. And they became immensely unpopular in their hometowns and in their own communities. Um, And Hawthorne, to his credit, stands by Pierce in a way that very few friends would. And that's what I found most touching. He actually dedicates a book, his last book in 1863 to Pierce. His bookseller says, we can't sell any books if you dedicate your your book to this just misbegotten, horrible former president. He says, I don't care, I'm, I'm doing it. Pierce also stays incredibly loyal to Hawthorne. Um, Pierce provides all the jobs for Hawthorne when he can't make a dime from these books that he's writing. He writes two books in 1852, House of Seven Gables and Scarlet Letter, both big successes. I mean, we we have been subjected to the horrors of having to read the Scarlet Letter for you know 200 years almost, um, but it didn't sell. It got great reviews, but didn't sell. Uh, Pierce made sure he got jobs. And Hawthorne, in exchange, stayed very loyal to him. Pierce stayed loyal to him. And they end up taking a trip at the end of Hawthorne's life up to uh, the woods of New Hampshire. Hawthorne is sick. Pierce checks in on him twice in the night. The final time he checks in on him, Hawthorne is dead. He opens his, the, the handbag that he has next to his bed. And what does he find in the bag? A picture of himself. Just shows you how loyal and loving the two of them were really against the world. All right. The last one I want to ask you about is Harry Truman and Eddie Jacobson. So, you know, Israel, uh, it's 1948. Uh, Truman's wavering on whether to recognize Israel as a state. 
his friend Eddie Jacobson steps in. How influential was Eddie Jacobson and now what we uh, know as modern history of that region and how it's impacted the world? Yeah, this goes to what, what Anthony was saying earlier. I mean, this is this is just shows that it really requires a first friend, somebody who's known a president for decades and knew him in more humble times when they had a much easier, less formal relationship. And you could say anything you wanted because you shared interests and values and really rooted for each other as the two of them did. So Truman is really annoyed. Um, the Jews in 1848 are hectoring him to recognize the state. He's sick of it. You know, his family's not particularly in love with Jews. They don't let Jews into their home in Independence, Missouri. He's been generally supportive of allowing refugees from the war to go into Israel, but he's just tired of the issue. And he says to, to Eddie, don't come and see me. I don't want to talk about this issue. Eddie just says, to hell with it. Eddie gets on a plane, flies across the country, walks in unannounced, uninvited into the Oval Office. And he basically says to Harry Truman, knock it off. I know you, Harry. I know you're better than this. The fact that you are allowing a few Jews to get under your skin and keep you from doing what you know is right, which is to, in this case, was to see Chaim Weitzman, who was waiting in New York to make the final pitch. And everybody knew that Weitzman was the key to convincing Truman because he had great respect for him. He said, you know you should see him. And he looks over at a, at a little statue of Andrew Jackson and basically says, be like Andrew Jackson, your hero. You know what Andrew Jackson would do. You need to do it. And Truman is furious. He turns his chair in the Oval Office. He drums his hands on the, the desk. And then he finally turns around and says, God damn it, you son of a bitch. You win. I'll see him. And that ultimately leads to this meeting nine days later with Weitzman. And then 11 minutes after the state of Israel is declared in 1948, Harry Truman is the first foreign leader to recognize the state. And it, you know, it really becomes the foundation for this alliance, this relationship between the two countries for the last 73 years. All right. You know, Eddie Jacobson had a huge impact on history uh, for certain with that intervention. Last question is about the Biden administration. So as you've examined the Biden administration, does he have a clear cut first friend who's, who has an outsized impact on his decision making and worldview? He does. He does. Uh, if you ask 100 people around Biden who it is, they'll all say, tell you it's Ted Kaufman, who was a senator right after Biden becomes vice president. He was his chief of staff for 22 years. The average length of a chief of staff today in the Hill is three years. So for 22 years, he works all day with him in the office. Then he takes the train back and forth to Wilmington. So these two form an incredible relationship. I mean, they're as close as as two people can be. It was it was Kaufman who told him to drop out of the race in 1987. It's Kaufman who wakes up when Biden wakes up in the hospital in 88. It's it's Ted Kaufman who's sitting there after his aneurysm. He is the first consoler, the consoler in chief when Bo dies. And they speak all the time on the phone. And Ted Kaufman was the first person to sleep in the White House when Biden became president outside of family. It just shows you how close the two are. I thought you might say Champ Biden, rest in peace, the, the beautiful German shepherd that just passed. But uh, Ted, Ted Kaufman, <laughs> uh, yeah, from speaking people in the Biden orbit, they echo what you're saying. But uh, Gary, it's fantastic to have you on. Congratulations on the new book, First Friends. You know, you really covered a topic that from from reading reviews and, and commentators, it wasn't really something that had been delved into in depth. Uh, and, and so you really broke ground with this book. And I think people will really enjoy reading it. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks so much for joining us on Salt Talks. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Anthony. It's great, it's great to have you on. It's a phenomenal book. It was a great read. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you. And you paid me a compliment, which I, I'm hugging you for over the phone, you know, because I'm only a year younger than you. But you made the insinuation that I was a lot younger. Did you catch that, John Darcy? It's amazing what hair that? dye can do, and I'm not going to go okay. into the other and, stuff. And by the way, I don't even have the dye. gel in this morning because I was in such a rush to get to this salt talk. I didn't even have the gel in. So Ginsburg, you are slowly becoming one of my first friends. Okay, no, I if, I, if I ever make it back in the politics, you'll be stuck with me. Okay, I just no, want you to know that. I would welcome it. All right. Well, Thanks thank you again. Us. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's Salt Talk with Gary Ginsburg, author of the new book, First Friends, uh, which is out July 6th. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous Salt Talks, you can access them on demand on our website at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube. We're also on social media. We're most active on Twitter at Salt Conference. 
We're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. But on behalf of Anthony and the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon. 